Yeah. You just you could have just amended it and dismissed, girl. That was awesome. Amen. Amen. I mean, that was the truth too. That was good stuff. Today we're going to talk about hope. We're going to talk about living hope. I, I kind of like that. There's a lot of people that hope for things in the world, you know. I mean, you might hope you get a puppy or you might hope you get a pony. You hope about a lot of things. But that's not really the term, uh, the use of the word I'm talking about today. Today I'm going to talk about a hope that is, I know what is out there. And I'm moving toward it. And, and you're going to love this, guys. I mean, you're just absolutely going to love this. I believe... Start to finish, including the title slide. I got four or five slides today. That's it. Okay, so that's going to be really great. Uh, it's it's kind of like the TARDIS, though. I think it's bigger on the inside. There's a lot going on in just those four slides. So let's take a look. It's all going to be in First Peter. Uh, I was really excited to sit and listen to the Sunday school lesson today. I point over here because that's where the guys meet. And they were talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we talked a little bit about the disciples and their prayers and stuff. And the temptations and the things they would fall into later. And one of those is Peter. Now, the guy who's writing what we're about to read is a guy that denied Christ. He denied Jesus. He, he walked with him. He talked with him. He lived with him, he learned from him for three years. And then at this moment where it all is coming together, at the trial that Jesus has, he denies him. We'll look that up. Not just denies believing in him, denies knowing him. Basically saying to whoever is around him, this man never had any impact on my life. He said that three different times. And I want you to know something because, and we're going to get into it a little bit, sometimes guilt drives us to stuff, and, and we don't even understand how we got there. Sometimes, I mean, just life hits us, and then we're, we're, we're struck by things that we just can't get over. But I don't think any of you stood there have stood and told somebody else, that Jesus had zero impact ever on your life. Like, like Peter did. After that close relationship. And yet, we see Jesus later on seeking Peter out. Having a meal with Peter. Forgiving Peter. And setting him back on a path to ministry so that he is the man who writes what we're about to do. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again <clears throat> to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, I just want to stop there just for a second and talk about that. We've got to understand the author to understand the message. Now the Holy Spirit is moving Peter to write these words, but it's coming through Peter's heart out to the page. So this guy who denied Jesus ever having an impact on his life now says, all these praises to God. And he talks about this living hope that is in Christ. Now, there's something y'all need to know. If you have a relationship with Jesus as your Savior, if you've asked him to forgive you of your sins, to come into your heart, your life, to, to change you from the inside out, if you've met Jesus in that way, you have anchored your soul to the rock. Now, stuff happens in your life. Stuff happens from that point, before that point, after that point. The anchor is always there. I, 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 back when I was younger and lighter, I, I used to do some rock climbing and I did some rappelling and stuff like that. I really enjoyed that. I hate heights, but for some reason I really enjoyed rappelling. 
I never really understood that, but it works, okay? The, the most important part about rappelling is you have a rope. I guess even more important than that is you tie it off to something. Because just having the rope, that doesn't do much for you. So I want you to think about some. Now, I've rappelled with people, other people before. Now, I've watched rock climbers that will like climb right up a, a, a rock face, right? Like free climb it. And I've done some free climbing. Not vertically, it was more of an angle. And you can do that. Can you picture like getting a couple hundred feet up in the air if you're free climbing a rock and then you, you mess up and you fall? You're going to fall that whole distance back down. And, and that's really going to be uncool. Now, you have an option as a rock climber. You could climb with somebody else and you guys could tether each other. And that works out pretty good. You get a couple hundred feet up and you fall. Somebody else is on the other end of the road. You just better hope they're holding on to something pretty good. Because if they're not, guess what? You both get to fall then. But there's another option that you have. You can drive an anchor into the rock. And you can tie off to that as you guys climb. Then, if you fall, you only fall as far as you aim. And see, what I want you to know about this living hope is that in Jesus, what we have is the anchor tied to the rock. And when we fall, when we make mistakes, because we do, we're not perfect. We will never be perfect this side of heaven. So when we make mistakes, the anchor holds. When we mess up, Jesus still has us. I want you to just pay attention as we go further on here. So we've been born again in this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept for you in heaven. Or kept in heaven for you. Now, this goes on, but I want to stop for a second. By the way, the underlining is mine. This inheritance that we have, because of Jesus, is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Imperishable. It will not end. Shall not perish. The inheritance you have in Christ. You should think about that for a second. Having obtained that inheritance by being a child of God, by obtaining forgiveness through the blood of Christ and his resurrection. Having attained that, which you only get because of what he did, not because of what you do. <coughs> that ties us, that anchors us to an inheritance that is not going to perish, it will not go away. Now the thing about that is, when you make mistakes, or when I make mistakes, and when we get all human up in things, the inheritance is still there. My inheritance is not based on what I do. It ba is based on who I belong to. I mean, it's just kind of like what we have here among people. You know, if I had inherited things from my father when he passed, and I, I guess I got a couple. The inheritance I got from my father wasn't given to me because I was something special. It was because he was my father. And I was his son. Just how that works. God is my father. The inheritance is mine because I'm his son. Not because I deserve it, because I don't. Not because I'm worthy of it, because I'm not. Just because I'm his. Just because you're his. That inheritance is yours and it will not perish. Also... It is undefiled. You see, we have that inheritance, but we make mistakes. We mess up. And I know nobody sitting out there is going to be looking up and be going, oh, not me, preacher. No. <laughs> I don't know who you're, <laughs> that sinner over there, you must be talking about them. If that's how you feel, see me when we're done. Give me five minutes, that's all it takes. We are all sinners. I know that, cause, not because I know you, but because the Bible says so. And I trust it. We've all messed up. We're all going to mess up. 
But when we do, the inheritance is not defiled because of it. Don't get that? You and I, uh, metaphorically, we can roll around in the mud here. And while God does not want that for us, he has a better plan for us. He has other things for us. And sin is sin, and it's not right. And we need to confess it and move forward from it. But it doesn't need to control us. The guilt over it doesn't need to move into our joy with our relationship with our Lord. We need to confess it, be done with it, and move forward. We need to learn from those things that we might feel guilt over, confess them to God, and then move forward from them. Because I know people that have been torn up most of their life because of some decision 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It is hard to accept the forgiveness of our God for some of the things in our lives. But we need to. Part of our Christian maturity is understanding that God loves us so much he called you knowing every mistake you're ever going to make. Do you guys understand that? As I stand before you, I know, and it's the only way I'm able to stand up here, I know that God called me to be his son, and they did, he called me to be a minister, and called me to be a pastor, knowing every single bad, deep, dark thing in my life, ever, and anything that would be in the future, and he still called me to this moment to do this thing, because he loves me, because he had a plan for me to do something. And for you, too. See, this hope we have is a living hope. It's a going hope. It keeps on moving forward. Because our inheritance isn't touched by our mistakes. Our inheritance is secure because of who it is we're getting it from. So it is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. The picture, the, the terminology here in the Greek is like a flower. Now, at our house, we have a lot of experience getting really beautiful flowers. And after a while, no matter how good you are with them, those really pretty flowers, they die. They fade. They don't look as good anymore. Now, I have given uh, flowers to my wife before, and she put them in a vase. And uh, they look really great sometimes, you know. You don't want to buy ugly ones when you get them, so you buy pretty ones, right? <laughs> and so they're looking great. A few days later, I'm looking at them up there on the entertainment center, and they're okay, but they're a little bit droopy. And a week later, and they're a little saggy. And, and two weeks later, those things are dead, right, in the vase. But they're still there. My wife doesn't want to throw them away because I gave them to her. But they're dead, <laughs> okay? Sometimes I have to, have to take the initiative, okay, we're getting rid of these. You see, your inheritance never does that. No matter how long it takes for Jesus to come back to this earth, or for us to go to him, the inheritance stays the same. It is just as beautiful as the day he purchased it for us. It's just as beautiful as the day you accepted Christ as your Savior. And that can be today if you've never done that. So this inheritance that is imperishable and defiled and unfading it's kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time so the inheritance is being kept for you and your inheritance will not perish will not be defiled by anything and will not ever fade but even better Peter goes on, and this man knows what he's talking about. Even better with that, it gets even better, God's power is guarding not only our inheritance, but you and me. It gets really freeing once we understand this. There, there are people out there that think that by making some type of mistake, you can lose your salvation. And there's a logical flaw in that. You have to understand that 
You did not do anything to obtain your salvation, nor I mine. Nothing. All we did was accept an offer that Jesus paid for. Now, if I didn't get it in the first place, how in the world can I keep it? First off, if my perfection was what requires me to keep it, I never could. My own perfection doesn't happen, so I could never have attained it in the first place. It's Jesus that gave it to me. It's Jesus that keeps it for me. It's God himself who guards me and you, according to what Peter just wrote here. Amen. While we're moving toward that inheritance, even on the way, even when we stumble, even when we fall, even when we're not perfect, God is still guarding over us. Because we're his children. Now, I'm saying all this, that doesn't mean there aren't consequences for what we do. You know, back when I was climbing rocks as a younger man, uh, I was kind of involved in a rescue once, and I had to climb up about a 90-foot cliff to get over to the other side to help somebody up. And me and another guy were scrambling up the cliff to try to get over there and help this person that was stuck. And I got almost to the top, and I slipped. And, I, and for a moment, I, to me it seemed like forever, right? It's probably a few seconds. I'm hanging by one hand about 90 feet in the air. I can look under me. I can still remember. I mean, this was like you know, long ago. I can still remember there was a pickup truck with Boy Scouts in the back end of it. It went right underneath me while I'm hanging from this cliff face. I remember looking down into the bed of that truck. And for that moment, I'm like, it could all end right here. But it didn't. And you know what? For however long we're here, when we slip, when we fall, when we mess up, God's got us. We don't have to be perfect. What we need to do is keep getting up. We need to keep going. I mean, when I was hanging off that cliff face, one thing that went through my mind is don't let go. I want you to have that right now. Don't let go. It doesn't matter if you're hanging on by one hand. It doesn't matter if you're hanging on by a finger. Remember these things. One is that your hope is anchored to the rock. So eternity isn't the issue. Your perfection is never expected. But you are expected to get back up. To ask God for forgiveness. To come to Him. And let Him set you back on the path. He is ready to do it. He is guarding you. He is watching over you. Other passages of Scripture in the Old Testament say God is singing and shouting over you and rejoicing for who you are. It goes on and says, In this you rejoice. Sometimes it's hard to rejoice. But other passages of Scripture tell us to rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. Always. And in case you didn't get it, he said, again, I say rejoice. And this is a man who had been beaten and left for dead and shipwrecked and left in the middle of the war. He'd been through it. He said, rejoice in the Lord. Peter says, in this, rejoice. In my inheritance, I can rejoice. It doesn't matter what's going on right here and right now. I mean, it matters a little bit when you got to live through it. But what is it compared to what we're going to have? He says, in this rejoice, in the fact that God guards over you, is watching you, cares about you, providing for you, that God loves you in spite of yourself or myself. And that our inheritance is secure. Rejoice in these things. Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Even if it's tough right now. It's not ever going to get so bad you can't rejoice in your inheritance. 
It's never going to get so bad. You can't rejoice in the fact that God watches over you and guards you and loves you. So even if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We live in a time right now where in some places it's not all that cool to be a Christian. It's not that awesome of a thing out there. But you know, I don't think any of us join the family because we thought it would be cool to everybody out there. I asked Jesus to be my Savior because I knew inside of me I needed Him. And if you know that, you need to reach out and ask Him to forgive you and to be your Savior. The thing is, it comes from Him first. It's His conviction on our soul that causes us to turn to Him and receive it in some kind of a, a supernatural fashion. That's why there's so many times when younger people will come down the aisle because it makes sense. And they'll, they'll pray a prayer because it makes sense. And they'll get baptized because it, it's making sense. But they don't feel changed. It's why your preacher doesn't do things like they really try to intensify and draw you down and out because that's not what I'm about. I want God to draw you to himself. Amen. And if he does that, then what happens is going to be genuine. And what happens is going to be something incredible that's going to be revealed at the end. And what happens then is going to stand it when it's tested. See, we can have 20,000 people come down in a crusade. But how many will be standing when we're tested? We need to be people of the book. People of the Lord. People who stand during the test. And that only happens when our faith is genuine. When we believe in God and we are anchored to the rock. But oh my goodness, when that happens, the world needs to look out because there's nothing that can get I'm going to end with verses 8 and 9. It says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. I want you to just think about who wrote it again. Peter walked with Jesus for three years. Peter saw the empty tomb. Peter talked to Jesus after he was resurrected. Peter saw miracles. Peter had God himself set him on the path of his life. And he's writing and saying, how much more that you believe who have not held his hand who have not embraced him physically like I have. How much more because of your faith you have believed. How much more to rejoice in that blessing. And to be filled <clears throat> with an inexpressible joy. And with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith. The salvation of your souls. The whole thing is about getting back to that inheritance. The thing is, guys, if you've obtained that, then everything else is more free. If you understand that your inheritance is secure, your place in the family is secure, then you don't have to worry about chasing your tail about your salvation. You don't have to worry about chasing your tail about, does God love me? Yes, he loves you. He has said that over and over again. He's guarding you. Now you're free to do something else. Now you're free to stop thinking so much about your issues and start thinking about others. Now you're free to start intercessing for other people and lifting them up in prayer along with yourself. 
See, if you can nail down this vertical relationship with Jesus, it opens you up to that horizontal one with the rest of the world. And when you do that, you start creating an effect that goes beyond you. Jesus died for you and for everybody else. Nail down the you part and help other people to know about it. I want you to just pray for a second. Just close your eyes and pray. I want you to think about something. First off, do you know Jesus as your Savior? I'm not really asking if you've walked down an aisle or even if you've been baptized. Did He change your life? I mean, is there a place where you can point to, this is where I was before Jesus, this is where I am after Jesus? I don't want you to doubt anything, but I want you to be absolutely sure of everything. I want you to know, beyond any doubt, that Jesus is your Savior. Having that, first off, let me, let me say this. If you've got that, then I want you to start talking to God right now about how you can move forward from this place without any doubts, about how you can handle the losses, the falls, and everything else, and keep getting up. You just talk to him about it for a second. And if there's anybody in here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, i got to ask you something. Inside your heart right now, I don't want to, like I said, talk you into anything. In your heart, do you believe that, one, you're a sinner, and, and two, you need to be forgiven? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again? If you believe these things to the point where you're ready to commit your life to that belief, just pray and ask Jesus to be your Savior right now. Ask Him to forgive you. Confess that thing I just said. Confess you believe in Him. Confess that you need Him. And, uh, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything, but I'd love to pray with you about that if you made that decision today. I'd love to rejoice with you in that. So when we're all done here today, come see me and, and let me know. I, I locked the place up, so I'm the last one leaving. Just come see me. And my brothers and sisters have been praying for yourself and, and your walk with God. I want you to pray for somebody else right now. I don't want you to break any uh, personal health protocols or anything, but if you can reach out and touch another human being in this place, that would be great. It'd be really awesome if nobody in this building was alone right now. Everybody's connected. Yeah, that's something we've lost in the last year. Physical connection. That tangible thing that represents a spiritual truth. We are all connected as children of God. And we are all connected worldwide in the body of Christ. And Jesus says to take heart when we have troubles in the world because he has overcome the world. Pray for somebody else and they're overcoming. Wherever God puts on your mind, I pray for you guys that all of us would have in our minds that first we got to nail down our vertical relationship. 